Good morning, and welcome to the Mission of the Church 2020 uh, Lectureship, and we're delighted that you're here with us today. It features Dr. Ruth Padilla de Borst, uh, and it's entitled Living as God's People in God's World. And I want to let you know that uh, there will be a lecture today. There will be a lecture tomorrow night over at Hopwood Christian Church across the street. That'll start at 7 o'clock. And then the final lecture will be uh, here again in this chapel on Thursday, uh, same time, 11 o'clock. So the mission of the church uh, lectureship, uh, to my memory, uh, comes out of two different legacies. There was a uh, group of women over 40 years ago uh, who formed a fig tree fellowship. And uh, they got together to raise funds that early on provided, I think, for a <coughs> for a dean's salary, uh, so that's a good tradition for me right there. Uh, but also uh, books for the library, scholarships, um, these screens that we have here uh, are one of the things. But also uh, they supported a Mission of the Church uh, lectureship, which went uh, on uh, uh, down through the years. When that group uh, finished up its uh, work and service, uh, they continued to do some scholarshiping, but uh, the Mission of the Church uh, lectureships uh, were given over to another legacy. And that was started a number of years ago uh, in uh, Los Angeles, California. Um, the Westwood Christian Foundation uh, was put together to be a presence uh, on uh, the campus of uh, UCLA, the University of California at Los Angeles, specifically in the history department, uh, teaching uh, some New Testament, as well as some other courses there uh, at the church. Um, I actually was a part of that program as well, and that was at, at the time under the auspices of Emmanuel uh, School of Religion, uh, our former name here, uh, and I know of it that way. When that uh, foundation decided that its work uh, had been done, they had leftover funds, and they uh, graciously uh, gave endowed funds uh, to our institution here, and it provides for a number of different lectures, one of which is this mission of the uh, church lectureship, along with one on preaching and uh, one on church history. So all of that comes together to uh, help us to have an exciting week ahead, to uh, be able to come and have good discussions and to think deeply uh, about a topic that's important to all of us, which is the mission of the church, what it is that God uh, calls us to uh, be about. So I will start us with a word of prayer, and then I'll ask uh, uh, Mike Sweeney to come and introduce uh, our speaker this morning. Bow with me. God of mission. We are thankful to be here uh, in your presence, in the presence of your spirit, uh, to think through how it is that you have been active uh, and at work in our world and how you invite us uh, into that mission with you. We're thankful for uh, the funds that have come from uh, faithful people down through the ages and now uh, in our past, but uh, continuing in legacy. We're thankful for present people who bring their knowledge and skills and for our presence with one another uh, just to have fellowship, uh, to have good discussion, and to think deeply uh, about you. So we ask that you would be with this time, that your presence would be among us, uh, that you would bless us. In the strong name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Good morning. As uh, Dr. Ramsharan mentioned, Emmanuel hosts a number of different lectureships, and our Mission of the Church lectures only come around about every five years or so, so it is very important to us that we find a lecturer who is able to move not only the academy forward in its thinking, but the church with all of its ministry practitioners. And that's a tall order, and it requires someone who is not only gifted in thinking theologically and communicating that well, but someone who knows what it means to put those thoughts into practice. Or maybe more realistically, it means someone who is able to interpret for the rest of us the theological significance of their life in service to others. A couple of years ago, I was thinking about who this person might be that we should invite to come give these lectures. So I reached out to several colleagues in the American Society of Missiology and asked them to give me two or three names that would be on the top of their list. As you can imagine, I got a variety of answers, but only one name appeared on every list, Ruth Padilla de Borst. Ruth is the daughter of renowned Latin American theologian Rene Padilla. As you can see in the brochure, she received an MA in Interdisciplinary Studies from Wheaton College 
and went on for a PhD in theology from Boston University, which our Dean, Dr. Ramsharan, assures me is a respectable school. <laughs> At Boston, she studied with Dana Robert, who was our Mission of the Church lecturer in 1990. As you can read in the brochure, Ruth now resides in Costa Rica, where she serves along with her husband, James, with Resonant Global Mission. They are members of an intentional community named Casa Adobe, where they live in ways that I think very much bring to mind the church in the Book of Acts. I hope she'll have opportunity to talk to us about Casa Adobe, because I'm sure that many of us, especially our students, will find this holistic approach to life and ministry to be very refreshing. I'll let you read for yourself the different leadership roles she has in mission organizations, partly because I'm quite sure I would butcher the Spanish pronunciation of some of them. The important thing to know about Ruth is that in both her life and her deeds, she shows us that the gospel of the kingdom of God is about all of life. And that as emissaries of that kingdom, we need to show and, uh, to people that kind of ministry in ways that touch every aspect of their being also. So I'm delighted that Ruth could take the time from her very busy schedule to bring our lectures this year. Please help me welcome her to the pulpit. That's a tall order to follow, but I'm grateful to be here. Weathered. Weathered by storms and wars, parched by droughts and dictatorships, dried up by rapacious plunder and internal corruption. <laughs> Pillaged by drug and weapon industries that build up wealth in other lands, weathered land taken from Carlos and Maria raped by wealthy multinational mining and agro-industrial companies, weathered people, Carlos and Maria, abused of as cheap labor and rejected deportees. Weathered, yes, yet also smiling, singing, pulsating with life, breaking ways forward. This is Latin America, my Latin America. Necessary questions are these. In the midst of this desert, is there any good news? Good news that can sprout green life, replenish smiles, nourish song, even kindle dance? Is there any source of hope? Followers of Jesus from within different church strands within Latin America has, have been responding affirmatively to these questions, yes. While wars raged in Central America, while foreign powers and their internal lackeys vied for sovereignty and contested their land, small communities of faithful followers of a different sort of king affirmed their faith. Carlos and Maria sang, and I'll try. Vos sos el dios de los pobres, el dios humano y sencillo, el dios que suda en la calle, el dios de rostro curtido. Por eso es que te hablo yo, así como habla mi pueblo, porque sos el dios obrero, el Cristo trabajador. You are the God of the poor. The human, the simple God, the God who sweats in the street, the God of the weathered face. That is why I talk to you, as my people do, because you are God, the laborer, the working Christ. In hopeful song, these followers of Jesus witness to the good news. God did not, does not, will not side with the powerful in their self-serving wars, with the wealthy in their self-serving policies, with those who plunder the land and abuse of its people. God in Jesus Christ became human, became poor. God in Jesus Christ suffered abuse and unjust treatment. God in Jesus Christ got calloused hands, dusty feet, and a weathered face. God in Jesus Christ drew near, so very near, 
God knows of what we're made, and God still walks with us. Emmanuel. And God's purposes, effected through Jesus Christ, sustained through the Spirit, and embodied in the community of mutual belonging created by God's love, are ones of full life for the entire creation, and they will be fulfilled for Maria, for Carlos, for all. The problem is that today, as throughout history, power blinds men and women to this God. Please join me in prayer. Creator God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be guided by your spirit this morning. Remove our blinders so that we may see through Christ, the only Lord. Amen. Before diving head on into our topic this morning, there are two things I have to share. First, in proper Latin American manner, I must bring you greetings. Greetings from your sisters and brothers at Casa Adobe. It's the intentional Christian community to which my husband and I belong in Costa Rica. In this community, we're learning what it means to live day in and day out from Monday to Sunday, from shared meals to dirty dishes, from music night to community organizing, from composting to bridging cultural differences, what it means to live as a body of radical followers of the Servant King. This choice marks our lifestyle and our sense of belonging. These are two gospel matters that will be threaded through our conversation this morning. I also bring you greetings from Infimit, the International Fellowship for Mission as Transformation, a global fellowship of theologian practitioners that produces and promotes mission theology for the whole church to live out the whole gospel in the whole world. Second, a word about where I come from, just so that you'll get a little more about where my, my, where my perspective is marked. Although I was born in Colombia, I've lived in Ecuador, El Salvador, and currently in Costa Rica. I grew up in yet another Latin American country. During my teenage and young adult years, Argentina suffered under a military dictatorship that kept my country under the grip of fear, suspicion, torture, and overall denial of human rights for far too long. Their power seeped into all spheres of life. It was inescapable. This bloody backdrop to my growing up years contributed to shaping my almost allergic reaction to the abusive use of power and my burning passion to understand and live into the kingdom of God as one in which power is given away, justice is prioritized, life is sustained, and peace is possible. Now I invite you to accompany me on a brief excursion into Latin America, and you'll see these are weavings from Guatemala, and the life of the church that wavers between two missional paradigms, which I believe cut across history and geography and determine our capacity to contribute to God's good purposes for all people to live out our God-given mission. One is the more readily available official story, the one told by the powers of the day. The other is the story from below the story of the God known to Carlos and Maria, the story of the other Spanish Christ borrowing from John Mackay, the story of the God of the Magnificat borrowing from Mary. Crucial questions are, is God the God of empire, economic prosperity, and military might, more directly represented by and endorsing the powers of the day? Or do we serve, do we, so, do we serve the God of Christendom or the God of Jesus of Nazareth? Let's begin our trek. Scene one, the God of empire and the other Spanish crest. On the walls of the cathedral in Quito, Ecuador, two plaques register the names of the city founders. Among them is Juan Padilla, my ancestor. 
I don't share this with pride, however. Because Catholic churches were built upon the ransacked ruins of ancient Inca, Aztec, and Maya temples, also my ancestors. Spanish Portuguese Christendom was built upon the pillage and plunder of native population. John Mackay portrays the conquistadores as men with a passion for external rights devoid of ethical content and whose lives lacked any Christian attractiveness or consistency. The Christ they brought with them was a powerless one who, who told people to accept things as they were. The other one, the one, quote, who makes men dissatisfied with life as it is and things as they are and tells them that through him life shall be transformed and the world overcome, he wanted to come, but his way was barred. He was kept back in Spain by the Inquisition. Still a few followers of this other Spanish Christ, like Catholic missioners, Las Casas, and Pedro Claver sought peaceful cohabitation with the indigenous people. As they gave their lives away in compassionate pastoral work, selfless service, and the defense of the dignity of all people, they made known God as the loving one who protects the weak, affirms diverse cultural values, gifts everyone with skills and capacities, and builds a faithful community of mutual belonging from the bottom up. Scene two, the white god of the British Empire and public service through education. The 19th century is known as the great century of Protestant mission. This mission, however, was often cast in militaristic terms like missionary campaigns, advance, combat, soldiers of the cross, onward Christian soldiers. Christian influence was intermingled with commercial exploitation. On the other hand, some men and women, followers of the other Christ, sacrificially lived the good news of the gospel not only in their private lives, but also in the public arena, sharing Bibles and education, especially with the more relegated sectors of society, and so bringing to light the rich resources with which God gifted local people. Scene three. The God of capitalist progress versus the God of the poor who deserves radical following. As geopolitics shifted towards the end of the 19th century and the United States gained ascendancy, mission and empire took a new turn. Our countries continued feeling the impact of foreign mission work, but the origin of the missionaries and the funding for church life and work shifted significantly from Europe with its Protestant ethos to North America with its more independent, faith-based, evangelical, and Pentecostal mission paradigm. The century initiated with much confidence in the power of the gospel allied to progressive government policies for the transformation of the world. I still remember my Ecuadorian grandmother's pride as she recalled the valiant anti-conservative regime of Eloy Alfaro, the president who opened up Ecuador to the progress and Protestantism. However, soon two world wars and then a cold war raged. The expected progress arrived for very few. Dissatisfaction and unrest rippled through the continent. Peaceful reform and devent developmentalism were perceived by many as ineffective and violent revolution as the only way out of poverty and, equal and inequality in the continent. In the midst of what Gutierrez calls this revolutionary situation, the debate intensified. Is God the God of empire? and military might? Or is God the God of Mary's Magnificat? Is God more directly represented by and endorsing of the powers of the day? Or is God the working God more readily present among those devoid of power? In this heated context, two indigenous theological and missiological movements were born. Liberationist 
and radical evangelical. And a third, the Pentecostal experience, grew to outnumber both of these. They have all impacted the world far beyond their lands of origin. And with their portrait, we will end our historical sweep. So we'll first consider theologies of liberation. With this movement, I'm sure you should be familiar. After Vatican II, the Latin American Catholic bishops articulated their affirmation of God's preferential option for the poor. Sadly, this did not stop the officials of the Catholic Church from blessing the torture inflicted in clandestine chambers during many military dictatorships like the one under which I grew up in Argentina. However, it did inspire a popular church movement of base communities and offered grounding for the passionate commitment to justice on the part of Christians like martyred Archbishop Romero, now sainted by the Roman Catholic Church. The liberationist movement, grounded mostly around the margins of the institutional Catholic Church, but also present in Protestant circles, issued a radical call to involvement in social and political liberation. Several theologies of liberation emerged, and it's important to notice that there are theologies, not one. Though they differ in prox their proximity to left-wing ideologies and partisan revolutionary causes, these theologies share a commitment to the poor, a praxis of social transformation in light of the gospel, and the use of the analytical tools of the social sciences. Among them, Rubem Alves, Miguel Bonino, Emilio Castro are the Protestant evangelical liberationists. Catholic theologians like Gutierrez, Boff, and Segundo became globally known through their religious orders, their university lectures, and Orbis publishing. Meanwhile, official church opposition grew and took on forms reminiscent of colonial inquisition. With time, more conservative elements within the Roman Catholic Church sought conciliation, and in 1992, the bishops promoted the need for what they called a new evangelization, confessing the allegiance of church in power in the 500 years of Roman Catholic presence in Latin America, and calling for all believers to the ministry of evangelization, understood to include the struggle for justice and liberation. The second strand is the radical evangelical one known for its postulation of integral mission. The same debate seethed within Protestant evangelical and Pentecostal circles. In the early 80s, while I was in college, the Argentine military led the country into the Malvinas War in order, you might know it as Falkland, but it's actually Malvinas, in order to rally popular support for their crumbling administration. Many church leaders readily and uncritically blessed the initiative while turning a blind eye to the disappearances occurring at the very same time at the hand of that very same government. Theirs was the god of official Christendom whose sole role was to offer a rubber stamp to the doing of that oppressive regime. Followers of the god of the Magnificat, like Perez Esquivel, Federico Pagura, risked their lives in defense of human rights. In this context, and from within a Protestant evangelical matrix, the Latin American Theological Fellowship was founded in 1970 as a movement of radical evangelical renewal. For Justo Gonzalez, you might know his name, a church historian, Cuban, but living in the US, it is with the development of this movement that Latin American evangelical theology grew into its fourth self. You know the three selves? This is the fourth self, generating its own theology. Not just self-propagating, self, right? But self-theologizing in response to the particular context, as well as growing in awareness of the social dimensions of the gospel and later of the underlying structural realities. 
This is a truly indigenous Latin American movement that rests on the recovery of the historical evangelical tradition of Anabaptist, Reformed, Wesleyan strands, and seeks for relevance to current life in Latin America. Scripture is central, as is the value of incarnation in all cultures, which invites a positive dialogue with and critique of the unreflected symbiosis between faith and the culture of the missionizing nations. Discipleship engages all dimensions of life, including matters economic, social, and political. And theology is done in community for the sake of the life and mission of the church. Building, in many ways, on the shoulders of the interdenominational student ministry, IFES, you might know it as InterVarsity here in this country, this movement has generated consultations and publications in Spanish, Portuguese, and English, and I was happy to notice that you have the Journal of Latin American Theology here in your library. Through the decades, it has brought together Christians from very different traditions in the CLADE conferences, Congreso Latinoamericano de Evangelización, to reflect on the demands of God's mission in relation to the challenges of the day in all realms of church and public life. The FTL has also contributed a holistic emphasis to the missiological agenda of the global church beyond Latin America an inspiration to radical evangelical theologian practitioners from different regions gathered in Infinite. I mentioned that at the beginning, the International Fellowship for Mission as Transformation, the Center for Interdisciplinary Theological Studies, the Oxford Center for Mission Studies. Finally, no review of Christianity in Latin America is complete without consideration of the Pentecostal and Neo-Pentecostal church and movement. This movement was born, born early in the 20th century at the margins of Christian established life among the lower classes, but it grew exponentially in the second half of the century to occupy center stage. Pentecostal movement struck a chord of popular religiosity in ways that neither the established Catholic Church nor the illumined Protestant circles had. Some say that while liberation theology chose the poor, the poor chose the Pentecostal Church. Central to Pentecostal teaching is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, a focus on emotion, freedom, and spontaneity in worship, a search for holiness, an apocalyptic eschatology, direct access to biblical revelation, and the empowerment of lay people, including women, many of whom lead churches and freely exposit scripture. Over the last 40 years, Pentecostal growth became explosive and has resulted in many new denominations, churches, and church members. It has also had a noticeable impact on all denominations, including the Catholic Church. Many Pentecostal groups have more recently actually begun deepening their theological formation, their involvement in social matters, and their cross-cultural mission initiatives. At the same time, native and imported neo-Pentecostal churches and neo-apostolic churches began to consolidate during the last decades of the 20th century, many of them with strong elements of the prosperity gospel, ostentatious buildings, and very weak processes of financial accountability that are coming out in, even in the secular media. So the debate between the God of empire and the God of the magnificent rages in Pentecostal circles too. Plenty of mega church leaders in Latin America today claim their inheritance as children of the sovereign king and feed off their congregations in order to wrap themselves in the trappings of power and prestige of our consumer society. Some see the rapid growth of Pentecostal and evangelical churches as a sure sign that our time has come. After centuries of Catholic hegemony, it is now our turn to assert political ascendancy and benefit from the privileges of power. In contrast, other Pentecostal pastors and congregations 
have sacrificially moved into some of the most violent, violence-ridden neighborhoods, befriended gang members, opened opportunities for them to find livelihood. As did the Lord they follow, they are making God's love tangible through their embrace of the rejects of society. Theirs is the God of the weathered face. In sum, from the time the name of Christ was first uttered in the beautiful lands of Latin America, Christianity in this region wavers between submission to the God of institutional religion that colludes with the powers of the day and legitimizes oppression on the one hand and vibrant celebration of the God of the weathered face made known through the suffering servant who gives his life away and inaugurates a rule of justice and for full life for all on the other. The people called into being by the first are proud in their religiosity, uncritically supportive of the claims of their nation, and deaf to the calls of weathered land and weathered people. The community called into being by the second, in contrast, pledges ultimate allegiance only to the kingdom of God, an allegiance that enlists them into God's work of justice and courageously contests any claim that threatens its fruition. In light of this contrast, and trying to land this here, how are you, sisters and brothers from outside Latin America, called to walk, witness, and hope, along with followers of Jesus in the Latino world? You, better than I, can respond from within your context. So I will limit myself to positing three sets of questions I believe need to be faced if we are to contribute together to God's good purposes in God's world. First, a story. He belongs with you. You belong to each other. Paul's words were shocking. They blatantly contravened all logic. They made no economic sense. There was no room for them in the Roman imperial system. After all, Onesimus, the slave, had escaped, taking with him some of his master's property. Naturally and legally enforceable expectations included public discredit, severe dis discipline, and even execution. Onesimus, a slave of Philemon and Colossa, was a nobody sheer property to be disposed of as the owner saw fit and subject to tough legal dispositions. Yet Paul bold and lovingly addresses Philemon, celebrating the love that joins them in Christ and making this subversive call to a new form of belonging. He says, receive Onesimus back, but not now as a slave, much less as a fugitive thief but as a worthy brother. This call is not a private matter kept between Paul and Philemon. It's first made public when Paul writes the letter in prison in the presence of his companions, Epaphras, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke. It's then made known to yet a broader audience when it's read by Philemon's wife, Appia, his son, Archippus, as well as the entire church that meets in their home. How dare Paul expect such out-of-the-norm behavior from Philemon? What grounds does he have to set the bar so high? Paul rests his entire case on the demands of Jesus' way, the way of love, of human dignity, of belonging in a new community generated by Jesus' life and ministry. Both biblical and other historical accounts portray this as a community that laughs at humanly constructed borders and imperially imposed exclusions and constructs subversive belonging from the bottom up, a community that far transcends its local expressions, subverts the worldly logics of power and dependency, lives an alternate economic morality, and repositions all its members as equals at the foot of the cross. 
Imagine, for example, what it meant for the mother church in Jerusalem to step down from her pedestal to receive monetary support from the mission church in Asia Minor and to release precedence when the followers of Jesus in Antioch were granted the privileged name of Christian even before they were. Or for the council in Jerusalem to heed the words of the newer Christians spread around the Greek or Roman world regarding what the way of Jesus really consisted of. So the first necessary questions, set of questions has to do with identity and belonging. At stake in Paul's appeal to Philemon is not a matter of legality or Roman imperial expectations. It was not a matter of convenience or personal advantage to Philemon. It was a matter of the identity and belonging granted to all parties by Jesus' reconciling action. Now, today it is well known that while the first millennium of Christianity was the millennium of the Eastern Church, the second was the one of the Western Church, the third is the millennium of the third church, says Escobar. The shift of the center of gravity of Christianity to the south is now an uncontested fact. Conferences like this one are evidence that a new interest has been kindled in contextual theologies for the third world, as if all theology were not contextual. But I dare pose the, these questions. What motivates this growing openness to global Christianity? Might there be an element of self-interest in this approach, a search for a means of survival and renewal when the northern western Christendom is in crisis? I would challenge us all to step into new forms of north-south relations that are born out of authentic respect and a sense of mutual belonging to which Paul appealed. This might entail not merely inviting sisters and brothers from Latin America, Asia, or Africa as speakers to a conference and studying writings generated in other contexts for fresh thinking, but perhaps actually inviting Maria and Carlos to step out of the restaurant kitchen to stop waiting at your tables and to share instead in your communion and sit with you around your family dinner table. It might mean reconsidering your identity and belonging as part of this unlikely, unconventional family, struggling to overcome cultural, linguistic, culinary, and even maybe legal barriers in order that we may all truly experience the banquet of the kingdom of God. This might actually open up the church in the north to being enriched by missionaries from below, men and women who are crossing geographic, social, and cultural borders and migrants and refugees and renewing the North American church. You can read Sun Chan Ra's book, The Next Evangelicalism, to get a glimpse of that. This might also mean that theological institutions in the North may need to seriously assess their curriculum and their educational priorities, asking if these are really growing out of and responding to the needs of the current constituency and drawing on the wealth of the two-thirds world and indigenous perspectives already present in the so-called first world. This, of course, brings up a second set of questions related to social justice. In the case of Onesimus, Paul's demand was not some warm, fuzzy charge. It had social, economic, and political teeth. In Guns, Germs, and Steel, Jared Diamond depicts the stark contrast in the development of the people groups living on land that yielded nutritious grain and those that did not. Today, privilege is spelled out differently. Privilege may have started in the innocent difference between the protein content of grains, but now we must grapple with the impact of centuries of imperial power, generations of accumulated capital, millennia of systemic injustice and deprivation. 
Seminaries, scholars, theologians, church leaders, Christians at large in the West cannot simply settle for the current survival or well-being of their own institutions as if there were no relationship between them and other expressions of Christ's body in the same city or across the globe. In what ways is this accumulation of power the plunder of creation, the ensuing in economic inequality being dealt with theologically, missiologically, ethically in North America? What place do social ethical matters have in pastoral and leadership formation? In what ways is the church in the North practicing jubilee, a leveling of resource allocation and opportunity? I suspect contextual relevance could be gained if some of the traditional and artificial disciplinary silos between theology, biblical studies, missiology, ethics were broken, and the very nature of the theological endeavor were rethought, inspired in the more fluid and interdisciplinary models generated in the global south. Instead of teaching and learning theology, you did theology. Valdir Steuernagel, a Brazilian theologian, beautifully portrays theology as an action performed in community for the sake of obedience, and I cite, theology is done in the communion of the chosen ones, living out the agony of the vocation experience. Theology is done in community and experienced in community as well, in the sharing of stories, and in the anguish of trying to understand and discern everything well. It's a shame that we've reduced theology to an individualistic speech expressed in words accumulated in books and dissertations. Theology must recover its place in the gathering of the called ones. Finally, the last set of questions I propose needs to be grappled with is related again to power. We began today with a brief, very brief and superficial excursion through the gallery of time during which we encountered two faces of Christianity and mission in Latin America. Circumstances, actors, and settings changed. But what has persisted until this very day is the tension between the god of empire, the supposed god of empire, and the God of the weathered face. Reviewing this historic tension can alert us to similar patterns today and raise our awareness of a typically human presumption. No matter the field, the expectation is that might makes right. The higher good is intrinsically linked to power. Powerful people and places, structures and institutions not only have more, know more, produce more, live more, they also are more. Within this logic, the powerful have a natural right to be heard, to be emulated, to prescribe the good for others. These prescriptions come in many shapes and forms. Austerity measures supposed to bolster floundering economies. Language standardization policies to unify a country political interventions to institute democracy, even religious mission ventures to save the natives. Common to all these prescriptions is the unstated assumption that power dictates standards that simply need to be replicated for good result. Followers of Jesus in North, South, West, and East cannot but question this presumption and deconstruct power in light of God's preferred method, revealed through Jesus, the poor carpenter of relegated Galilee. Dare we explore what in divesting from power might look like as educational institutions, churches, NGOs? Dare we release control through selfless service and walk alongside those marginalized by our society that is so relentlessly racing to the top? Dare we believe that life and hope are found, as Walter Brueggemann affirms, quote, in receiving and not grasping, in inheriting, not possessing, 
in praising, not seizing. In sum, do we worship the God of imperial power or the God of the weathered face revealed most perfectly through Jesus Christ? The people called into being again are proud of their religiosity, uncritically supportive of the claims of their nation, and deaf to the calls of the weathered land and weathered people. The community called into being by the second, again in contrast, pledges ultimate allegiance to the kingdom of God, which grants them a new lifestyle and new belonging. This allegiance enlists them into God's work of justice and courageously contests any claim that threatens its fruition. May we dare to accompany Maria and Carlos in confessing through our lives as well as through our words that ours is the God of the weathered face who has rolled up God's sleeves in order to carry out God's beautifully creative and recreative work in God's world. May we too roll up our sleeves and join the working Christ, recognizing that God's work does not take place by human might, nor by human power, but by God's spirit. Amen. Thank you.